morning, everybody. This is T. Falcon Napier. Welcome to the Circle of Brilliance. Today we are going to continue our discussion on neurotransmitters. Little by little, we are working our way through the pile and uh, having a lot of great discussions along the way. So for all of you that are joining us for the first time, thank you so much for fitting us in to your schedule. If you have anything you'd like to contribute to the conversation, please feel free to do so. And remember, if you do contribute, we list you on the uh, details of the video so that people want to go like, who is that? Then they'll know who you are and um, we'll even provide a link for them to uh, uh, be able to um, to um, uh, reach out to you. So uh, with that, um, I was reading a couple of things. Um, they're in front of me right now on a different screen about GABA and about glutamate. And so Brian, um, I'm going to tell you my understanding of them and then we'll let you as our as our resident authority on all things neurotransmitter related you can correct it uh, but they said that the GABA and glutamate have a, uh, a sort of a, a, a an inverse relationship so one is very excitatory the other is very inhibitory so GABA was inhibitory and um, glutamate was very excitatory um, that both of these uh, neurochemicals, and they're both actually, I guess, amino acids, um, can trigger severe problems when they are too high. And obviously, there's some consequences when there's too low. So it's more of a matter of what's the right amount of both of these to have. And so it brought up a question for me then. And that is that if it's not that one is good and the other is bad. It's that you'd like to have a balanced amount of each of them. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And that's, that's a normal uh, regulatory effect of them working together. As I said, glutamate is the precursor for GABA, right? So when too much of glutamate is produced, GABA being the brakes, if you will, will take over from there. Same thing with like norepinephrine and epinephrine. So they have that same kind of relationship. So when those are not balanced, the dysregulation causes some significant problems. And as I mentioned on the last call, in rare cases, it can cause death in terms of glutamate because that happens within the cells. Yes. And when yes. I went to my medical books to look it up, glutamate is actually um, called an excitotoxin um, because it's in the nerve, uh, it's, it causes neurodegenerative uh, disorders. Mm -hmm. Because imagine these are cells, these are natural producing cells in the body. So if they can't do what they're normally uh, designed to do, then what they do out of protecting themselves and protecting the region is they commit cellular suicide. Mm -hmm. So the cell that's dysregulated will kill off itself so that the other cells are not impacted by it. And so you can just imagine that. exactly, <laughs> exactly. So you can imagine when that starts to create some problems. So when I was looking in the, in the, my medical books, I said, let me see what kind of diseases are associated with it. So I had like uh, fibromyalgia, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. These things can cause some serious problems. And that's what I was referring to last time when I'm talking about how it like short circuits. Because mm -hmm. you need these cells to replenish themselves. They do that anyway. Um, but the GABA glutamate relationship creates this regulation where that's happening. And the glutamate has to happen at the right time and in the right amount. And it already knows how to do that. But there are certain things that we can ingest in our system or certain infections that can just cause that system to go haywire, such as uh, pesticides nerve gases, it will short circuit those ends and how they communicate. And so now you have, uh, you know, some se severe functionality issues. So this is, this is interesting then. Let me, let me just go back to GABA for just a second because I ended up modifying the diagram a little bit. So we were having quite the discussion around where does GABA move us on the change grade. Remember everyone, we uh, uh, kind of finally picked up on how frequently everyone kept talking about neurotransmitters being very short-lived. And if something is short-lived, it's going to more likely serve as a change grid maneuver than it's going to serve as a characteristic of being in a particular place on the change grid. And that was feeling very right 
until uh, I started reading more about GABA and about glutamate because these are amino acids. And so they tend to, uh, they, while they may serve as neurotransmitters, they also exist in a certain quantity um, at all times. And anything that's going to be that persistent is going to have or has the potential for having more of an impact on the overall uh, patterns in behavior of the individual. Am I right so far, Brian? And you, Absolutely. You guys are the doctors on here, so <laughs> you, you got to correct me if I'm saying any, anything that's really, really wrong. And so while these may serve as neurotransmitters, they are also something else. So yes, they might have some very short-lived role, but they also have a more enduring role. So, um, one of the things that I was reading about GABA is that GABA is very much about um, helping someone to, um, to uh, relax, I guess. Let's, yes. Yeah. So, and so when GABA is at its absolute highest level, by the descriptions of the, the, the downside of too much too much GABA is you become someone who can barely keep yourself awake. Um, so you are so relaxed, so whatever other word you want to put in there, um, that you basically just kind of zone out. Yeah, is that, is yeah. that right? Because they're saying like yeah. GABA is a lot of time used to help people who are having sleep issues. They look yeah, at GABA. Yeah, so low GABA activity associated with things like uh, chronic stress, depression, difficulty concentrating, muscle pain, because remember we're talking about how these GABA and glutamate are responsible for cell uh, signaling and information processing. So insomnia and other kinds of sleep problems. So if, if, if GABA are the so-called breaks, you know, and, and when it's low, then you're almost non-existing at that point when it comes to, you know, this there's no activity going on there that should be. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now, and again, I, I want all you guys to feel free to unmute and chime in what you're thinking about here. Tom has a, a little question here. Can you speak about thresholds as they relate to habits and chemical stability in a dynamic system? That's quite a question. I'm very impressed by the question itself. <laughs> so I am. I just I truly am. Um, so, like the thresholds of activation and the threshold of delegation, is that what you're going, Tom? You're, well, you're, you're, yeah, this is Tom. I, what I'm thinking about is I listen to this and I can't understand chemistry, even though Brian's so good at explaining it in layman terms and it's very helpful. But when you think about sales, which you've worked a lot in, and you think about using a maneuver, to create an impulse and then they buy and you know where that's located in the change grid. But most of us are involved in helping clients for sustainable alignment to their higher aspirations while they deal in the real world of day-to-day uh, of -day tension on, on the runway. So my, my question about thresholds is, that is this idea that you mentioned that these neurotransmitters aren't lasting and are related to maneuvers, but that also uh, that there are longer term chemical balances of all these things. And so my question is, if we're helping a client, we're probably going to put them in a level of tension that wouldn't be sustainable and that that's a good thing because that's where change would happen. But is there a way that over time, the body adjusts like an athlete, things that would just totally flip out my system, you know, an athlete yeah. deals with no big deal. And so I'm just wondering, in the, 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 the thing that's clear here is it's dynamic. It's mm -hmm. a, a, as the whole master stream is. And can we learn to have the chemicals work in, or I ca chemicals mm -hmm. are wrong, that mm -hmm. word, the neurons work in longer term harmony by getting habits. And I think it would, the threshold would change. Yeah, I have to tell I have to tell you guys and all of you that are on the call, let me, let me chime in if you agree. That question deserves a round of applause. I think that is really, really, really good. I mean, you you touched on so many things that triggered thoughts in my own head about, oh, I'll talk about this, I'll throw this in, oh, I could say this. That's just a really 
good question. So, um, well, thank you. Okay. Where something lives on the change grid is very helpful, but I think what's more helpful is managing the flow yes. because we can't just live, we can't just say the ideal location is here. We're going up and down and in and out. You're right, you're right. Time. Well, in fact, let, let, me, let me start by saying this idea about thresholds. So in, uh, in basic training, of course, we all talk about that the threshold of activation tends to be upgrid on the brink of a stress response and the threshold of delegation tends to be downgrid on the brink of an apathy response. But then that same slide as the second bullet point says that the actual location of either threshold varies based on the activity in question, the individual and the moment in time that we're looking at. And so I think all of us in our role as human development professionals have had plenty of experiences where the client does something faster than we were anticipating. We go like, well, wow, that didn't take anywhere near as much effort as I thought it was going to take. Or they don't seem to respond um, as quickly as we thought they might respond. We feel like, well, what, what are they not getting? What are we missing here? And so all of that, even that, that languaging is speaking to the existence of these thresholds. When is something enough of a, um, of, uh, of, a uh, of a contributor to actually trigger the behavior to actually occur. And I'm reminded of all of my classes in chemistry where we learned this verb about titrating a solution. So okay. that was when you could introduce just the right amount, and I mean right down to the little micro drop of whatever the reagent would be in order to trigger the reaction that you were looking for. And what I think I'm, I'm kind of seeing about neurotransmitters is that they are experts at titration. Exactly. They seem to know when is just the precise amount to trigger whatever the response at hand happens to be. So and I would so say that training changes that, right? When you train conditioning, stuff. training. Yeah, yeah. Go because ahead, Brian. I would faint in a situation that Brian would just handle. You know, the guy's bleeding and I would faint. Not very yeah. helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Even yeah. if I studied what to do, tourniquets, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I faint. The, the threshold gets trained. Uh, you're, 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 you're right. In fact, let me just share one personal uh, experience. And then, uh, Brian, if you can give us a little bit more of the science behind it, that would be great. But um, I, when I was a kid, I grew up in an extremely quiet household. There was a lot of dysfunction behind why things were quiet, but nobody ever said anything to anybody. It was uh, the only sound in the household would have been the television. So, uh, so for me, my whole um, chemistry was very accustomed to being in this quiet, unstimulated or understimulated sort of environment. Well, I got invited to my very first sleepover and this particular family was first generation uh, European, um, mostly Italian, I think is what their makeup would have been. And so, um, so of course, they bring their culture with them. And that culture still tends to be very vibrant because they haven't really had a lot of chance yet to be contaminated by their new, their new circumstances. And so I'm in this household and we're having a conversation around dinner and the amount of noise, the amount of sound, I interpreted everything that was going on as being horrible arguments, that everyone was at odds with one another. Meanwhile, they considered that to be normal. And so to your point, Tom, my reaction initially was, oh my gosh, I have to get out of here. And I think all my neurotransmitters and everything else that could be working uh, was saying, you are in danger. This is an unhealthy situation. Run, 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 run. Well, um, go six months down the road, I've been to that household, uh, you know, a dozen times or more. And instead of finding that situation troublesome, I started to find it rather interesting. And uh, I never did feel like it was my idea of normal, but I think I got conditioned and all of my neurotransmitters said, oh, we get it. This is, you're, you're not in any real threat. You are, you can adjust accordingly. So I'll, that's, I'll stop there. So Brian or anyone else, what might you want to throw in about what I've just described? Yeah, I think you're, you're spot on because it's very important to remember that 
all of these neurotransmitters are not single actors. So they have receptors, they have hormones. For instance, there's three classes of hormones, right? So there are amines, there are peptide proteins, and there's steroid. Cortisol acts as a steroid that impacts your hormonal system. So if you think about that, it's controlling how the body responds to stress and infection. It regulates metabolism. That's why, I don't know if any of you noticed, like when you upset, like you can't eat, you don't have energy to digest food properly. So it's controlling all of these different functionalities. And when they're saying like on the list that we have here, it's associated with this thing, this thing, this thing, it's not a either or, it's oftentimes both and. Mm -hmm. So you have to think from a really integrated perspective in order to really get what these neurotransmitters and the receptors and hormones and how they work as an ecosystem that we do condition. Uh, we become conditioned to these. So we have different uh, thresholds, if you will, or as we like to call them, baselines in all of these areas and how these transmitters work for us. And so, like, say a physician doesn't understand, like I'm going through a case right now where there's a 30-year-old that's now committed to a long-term uh, facility because of her dialysis complication. So there's a lot of things on her part that she did not do in terms of keeping up with dialysis appointments and things like that. But then there's some things that the physicians who were seeing her didn't understand about her, like her mental thresholds. So when she was really, really tired, they should have picked up on that and seen that perhaps they need to get this CAT scan that was supposed to be ordered previously. And so now she's had the worst condition uh, uh, impact of it to where she's in a long-term facility, all because they didn't understand her thresholds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand what her baseline points are. So you can't do this in this haphazard, like I call it drive-by uh, uh, care kind of way. So when we're not picking up on the signals that our bodies are always providing for us, then we can't work with it. So that's why I don't like the conversation a lot of times when people are like, oh, stress is bad, stress is bad, stress is against you. Stress, again, is an adrenal response that biologically, its sole responsibility is to get you to move. We seem to not mind stress if we're standing in the middle of the road and a truck is coming our way. Stress will inspire you to move to lo another location quite quickly. Mm -hmm. So it works in your favor, yep. right? Yep. So we have all these baselines. But again, if we're not paying attention to our body and because most of the time some of these things go underneath the radar of awareness, then we can't work with them. So when they say like neuroendocrine, that's just simply saying how these neurotransmitters, receptors, and hormones work together to impact the endocrine system. When they say neurohormonals, the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it impacts everything that we do, literally. And we have these baselines. But again, if you don't know what the baselines are, then they can't work for you. Excellent. Okay, anyone else want to throw something into uh, to the, the discussion around this? And then I'm going to give you guys a quiz question. I like a quick comment on the stress. When I talked to Dr. Maurer, he said something fascinating, which is that stress is to get you to move. It's a relatively recent usage in psychology. It was a physics term, but we are now capable of keeping the stress response open long after whatever the threat is. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what's damaging. Exactly. Because you don't even know where to move. So if there's a tiger and the stress response gets you to move, then that's good. But then if three weeks later, you're still resenting the tiger, that stress yeah, right. doesn't you tell you where to let move. It go. You couldn't let yeah. it go. And, and so we need to be aware that stress isn't meant to be like willpower. It's a short-term, very powerful exactly. motivator. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And isn't, excuse me, isn't that what PTSD is, the memory of that stress that stays in your cells and, and you somehow keep repeating it in an yeah. unhealthy way yes. and it gets triggered, you know, by situations um, so that you're in a constant or, or a potentially constant state of stress. Yeah, that's the key word, Kathy, is triggered. Something triggers it. So like I said, when behavioral scientists are studying in the laboratory, these, um, uh, what we call feelings, a moto in Latin means movement. So what they're studying is, okay, what triggered this? Is it something internal? Is it something external? Because remember, from an interoceptive perspective, that's what the nervous system is looking at. 
what is going on internally and is trying to match this internal state with what's going on externally. So all these receptors all throughout our body literally are recording our external experience. And so when we don't feel safe, you're going to experience it, just as T said in his training for massage therapy. It registers somewhere in your body. So I know Kathy, Pam, and Jane are all into the somatic. That's, that's important because, again, we don't know how to feel what we're feeling. And so instead of feeling it and then making, using perception, thought, emotions, and behaviors to go four for four, as I like to call it, instead of that, we try to suppress it. And so we're not really dealing with the right thing. And I think this is the these influx of everyone wants a pill, like the answer is in the pill right now, right? Mm -hmm. So they get the pill for everything. I think I was reading somewhere where one out of three um, uh, people are on stress-related medication. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, Jane, you had your hand up. Um, or did you? I saw you took it down. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, I was just going to say, and just kind of pass, a little bit past back in the <clears throat> conversation, but it used to be back in the days where the saber-toothed tiger came and you had that stress response, you you had that flight and that immediate, you know, release of inner energy, and um, that just doesn't happen anymore. You know, we don't have the ability to discharge that energy mm -hmm. a lot of times, and unless we um, train to do that. And, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it gets built up over a long period of time and, and causes that release of cortisol, which lasts so much longer and um, causes, you know, ongoing chronic mm -hmm. diseases and things like that. Yeah. You know, this is all getting back to what we were talking about mm -hmm. on the dark side of the change grid a couple of days ago. And we were talking about what's going on in our society right now. I'll switch to that diagram for just a second. So we've got these uh, one group of people that's in the upgrade danger zone where they're alarmist and frightened and all the things that you see there. And we've got this group in the outgrid danger zone that are coming across as cruel and brutal and all these sorts of things. And they've got very high levels of uh, endorphins going on, um, uh, or adrenaline rather going on. They have uh, very high levels of dopamine that are, uh, that are present and when you put um, those two things together, what's the likelihood or how easy is it to get out of that state? Because it sounds like the dopamine is kind of encouraging you to stay in that state. And because of what's going on, what's being talked about, the subject matter, those uh, that adrenaline continues to have, you know, never ending triggers happening mm -hmm. for it. So, yeah, right now are people becoming addicted to negativity. Right. I, I just saw last night a documentary on Netflix called The Social, Our, Our Social Dilemma. Mm -hmm. And I really encourage everybody to watch that because it's about um, uh, social media and how the incentives behind social media are to to generate clicks and they have these really powerful algorithms um and i'm sure you all all know this but they have these algorithms to drive uh clicks yeah. and their incentives are to make advertising money and it's just really starting to undermine society and everything it, it's a fascinating and kind of disturbing documentary. So I would encourage you to all see mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, we I was talking about that idea how, you know, we're building structures, if you will, in terms of our mental and emotional understanding of things. And it's creating this sustainable mediocrity. Mm -hmm. So when these tech companies are designing things, they literally hire like, and you can Google his name, BJ Fogg. He's at Stanford. So they hire these kind of behavioral scientists. They call them persuasion engineers. Yeah. So they literally design these algorithms to, uh, you know, to be addictive. They know what they're yeah. doing. They, yeah. University we, of California we are really, we have just partnered with um, Google for healthcare. And so they told Google, um, they told University of California system, in order for us to design the algorithms, we need patient information. And mm -hmm. 
they gave them information <clears throat> to help them design whatever kind of healthcare system they're trying to get into. I think that's very dangerous. Very dangerous. Well, let me add one more uh, aspect to that. Add COVID to this and the isolation that everyone has been uh, dealing with. Is it any surprise that in order to find some uh, satisfaction, some sort of stimulation, people have turned to the only thing that was available, which tends to be online social media. And now that media isn't there to help us all feel better about everything and, you know, more comfortable and more downgrid around everyone, it wants to sell advertising. And so it's doing the more upgrid stuff and the more outgrid stuff. That's probably what the algorithms are designed to favor. Yeah. Loneliness is said to be a public health crisis at this point. Mm -hmm. because Even with all of this technology out there, they, they really, they're considering loneliness to be uh, you know, uh, an epidemic at this point. Well, yeah, and that's been studied for quite a while because of exactly. how popular um, uh, home shopping network and things like that happens to be. In fact, I could show you guys a photograph. We have a neighbor four doors down, never met her, never saw her. But we're walking by her house, just out of a little neighborhood walk, and her front door, which is a regular large, you know, double wide door, you know, it's like a big, big entrance kind of way, is piled, literally, floor to ceiling, 10 feet tall, wall to wall, with boxes from Home Shopping Network and other online uh, places for buying stuff. We're talking, no exaggeration, hundreds of packages are piled up there. And so we thought, I might wonder, you know, is she still alive? Has anyone done, uh, you know, any kind of like a well-being check on this on this address? And and uh, we, a neighbor's out there, they go, oh no, the neighbor says, oh no, she's, she's definitely in there. This is what she does. She buys and buys and buys and buys. And I'm going like, isn't it interesting to spend, I mean, I know I was looking at thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. Well, is it because she is trying to somehow or another self-medicate her loneliness and her isolation by spending money because of these, um, what do we say, um, fake relationships that these people who are selling stuff on Home Shopping Network might be creating with their, with their viewers? I mean, I just, I went like, oh my gosh, what is the pathology behind what I am witnessing right here? But just just amazing. Now, all of this being said, what I want to make sure we're pulling this back to is that we're talking about neurotransmitters. So something has to be going on with their neurotransmitters, with their hormones, with whatever other uh, ingredient in there <laughs> happens to be that is causing this behavior or supporting this, these attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. So um, let's make sure we kind of get back to that. What is the what is the soup factor? What's the ingredient that is kind of reinforcing um, whatever these behaviors are? Uh, thoughts about that? Yeah, you're, you're right. The neurons, when we talk about, again, like the neuron endocrine system, um, you know, the reason I keep mentioning it is because the, those, <coughs> it's a large system. And so they essentially act like many factories producing these um, uh, products and it's these nerve terminal uh, terminal endings are very large they're very organized it has a very coherent terminal field so when we're talking about these things and these are things that can be measured not only physically but we can take someone's blood and say okay this is going on in your hormone system so these are things that we can understand at a high level in terms of how people are being impacted internally that's why I like things like um, the histamine, because that controls our awake cycle. So now we're talking about ultradian rhythms, where, whereas circadian rhythms deal with sleep, ultradian rhythms deal with rhythms while you're awake. And again, these are things that are measurable, they're uh, observable. So these are things that we can actually see and feel and experience. And when histamine is activated, it decreases GABA and increases epinephrine and norepinephrine levels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it has a serious impact in terms of your neuroendocrine system, in terms of controlling behavioral states, biological rhythms, energy metabolism, fluid balance, all of these things that deal with the homeostasis. 
And so again, what we've always believed about the change grid is that there is a spot on it where absolutely everything lives. And so as we're talking about how these neurotransmitters interact with one another, what happens as a result of those interactions, et cetera, hopefully you guys are hearing, well, that's a slightly different shift on the change grid or, oh, that would mean that we're going to encounter more of whatever here than we would encounter there. And so at a certain point in time, wouldn't it be interesting to be able to say, we can describe any and all behaviors based on what their bowl of soup contains at that particular spot. That would be awesome. And you know, I, would like, I, would, I would like to someday map out, like I said, there's over a hundred or so neurotransmitters. There's like 30 in the gut alone. Mm -hmm. I would love to be able to map that out because imagine the impact that has on your, even your diet. Well, exactly. Exactly. When you can say, um, rather than trying to find um, you using talk therapy as a way of fixing something, I wish Diane was on the call because, you know, Diane's big belief is that until you've got your chemistry in balance, there really isn't all that much to talk about because whatever <laughs> subject you're talking about could just be, um, you know, content that's been created in order to explain or justify whatever your imbalance is actually calling. So she's always said, let's get everything in balance and then we'll see if there's anything to talk about. <laughs> and I think that's absolutely spot on. Now, just to, to kind of bring things back to GABA for just a second. If when GABA is too high, the person gets very far down grid, even to a dangerous place where that um, somnolence, is that what, what's excessive? Hyper -somnol somnolence, is that? what too much sleeping would be, mm -hmm. um, yeah. then that would say that the, the, the question is, is this going to be something now, GABA, something that is going to be at its absolute worst, very far down grid. And as we move radially away from that as being the epicenter, we're going to see something else happen. Now, I'm babbling, but you guys will all get this. If what I've just said is true, we would expect to encounter the, uh, the impact of low levels of GABA in the outgrid danger zone, the upgrid danger zone, and the ingrid danger zone. Mm -hmm. So what does low GABA actually result in? Well, one thing I'm looking at here says anxiety, mm -hmm. chronic stress, Depression, but I believe depression actually lives down grid, but we have got to get on the back side of the change grid to see how that would happen. So I'm setting that one aside. Difficulty concentrating in memory problems, muscle pain and headaches, uh, and insomnia and other sleep-related disorders. So as I go around and I look at what I've just read there and I look at the outgrid danger zone, we talked about this before. Does anxiety exist in the outgrid danger zone? And our answer at the time was yes, but that anxiety is a different experience for that individual than the anxiety we would encounter in the upgrid danger zone or even the in-grid danger zone could have its own type of anxiety associated with it. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah. I wanted to just bring to your, your, your attention, instead of looking at levels of tension, uh, or rather, uh, yeah, the five levels of tension, I instead want to talk about the resulting vectors. So this should be review for all of you guys, but you know that in order to determine where someone is on the change grid, we look at two primary dimensions. So that's your perceived level of ability and the perceived level of challenge. There are two other dimensions that we include in four dimensional thinking. So we also talk about size and importance, but the two that tell you where you're gonna plop on the change grid are your perceived level of challenge and your perceived level of ability. Now, the, the, the way those two dimensions work themselves out ends up giving you two resulting vectors. One of those vectors is the level of tension that someone is experiencing, and that would be the vertical result. Um, and the other one is about the horizontal result. So we know tension is about what's happening up and down. What's happening right and left? Anyone remember? So high tension, low tension, over here low something, over here high something. 
motivation motivate drive is the drive. word the, the one that the label we came up with so motivation works just as well so um so that would mean that to end up in the outgrade danger zone you are experiencing a moderate level of tension but a high level of drive hmm. and if you're upgrid you are experiencing a, a high level of tension and a moderate level of drive. To be in grid, you would have a moderate level of tension and um, almost no drive whatsoever. So as I throw that out there, I'm wondering if we would say that the person who's in the outgrid danger zone, yeah, they think that their, their drive is very strong. They're, they're trying to make something happen, but they're not stressed out by it. That's, that's not it. Um, but might they have some sort of difficulty concentrating? Might they have some memory problems? Might they be prone to muscle pains and headaches, those sort of insomnia? What do you guys think? Do people in the upper danger zone get a good night's sleep? No. No, I don't think so. No, because what's happening? What do you think? They're just constantly pushing to, to finish, to do it, to work, to think about it. Right. And they, they might be laying in bed, but where's their brain? You know, where's their mind? <laughs> their, their mind is up and active and, you know, to doing whatever the next little plotting is that they need to do to achieve whatever that agenda happens to be. So it's not the level of tension that's causing the insomnia. It's the level of drive that's causing that insomnia. Fair enough to say, is that, you know? Yeah, that's it? interesting because you can, you can go to sleep, but if you don't go through all the sleep cycles, you can sleep for 16 hours. You'll wake up and your body feels just as tired when you yep. start to. Yep, yep, yep. We've often said that the worst night of sleep is not a, a, a night when you're too far up grid. It's a night when you're too far out grid because your brain's fully functioning. It's like running, it's doing all of its problem solving, you know. You might as well get up. Your brain already did. So um, so does that sound like a low level of GABA? Mm -hmm. um, yes. And then, yes, because yeah, I, I didn't sleep last night. So I can all right. <laughs> Because your brain was very active. And by the way, that would also mean, based on neurotransmitter soup, in fact, this was a question that I wanted to throw out for, for Brian. Um, just because one thing or one neurotransmitter is behaving in a particular way on the, uh, at a spot on the change grid, does that mean that the patterns and the other neurotransmitters will also be true? So I'll say this, is it true that outgrid, if you have a low level of GABA, you also must be experiencing a higher level of dopamine? Is it true that to be in the outgrid danger zone, you must be experiencing some heightened level of adrenaline or epinephrine? Hmm. I would, there, there's a truth to it. There's not the truth because again, what, mm -hmm. how these neurotransmitters function depends on what receptors they're connected to depending on where it's secreted in the body. So anytime you talk about like GABA in by itself with the, the peptides, the proteins that it's connected to, it's slow acting. So that's why you literally will experience that in your body. It doesn't need much prodding for it to work, if that okay. makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. They're, they're slow acting and they're produced uh, based on a prolonged action. Mm -hmm. So like when a neuron is communicating with each other, when we talk about something that's short lived, just the neurotransmitter itself. It's yes. called action potentiate. The, long, the stronger that action potentiate is, the more likely that it will actually connect with a, a receptor. And the connection between the receptor and the next synaptic connection has to fit like a locking key. So everything's very precise in which receptor it connects to and which one it doesn't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Brian, could you spell that term? Action what? Potentiate. Potentiate. Potentiate, yeah. as opposed yes. to potential. Yeah, P-O-T-E-N-T-I-A-T-E. -E. Right. Oh, okay, got it. Mm -hmm. um, that's very interesting because, you know, when we are using the change grid and trying to create like the adjective map, we've always liked to at least hold the belief, wrong though it may be, but I, I think it, it's correct, is that things travel as a set. 
So when you're up in stress and you are feeling out of control, um, the emotions associated with stress are also going to be present. So now there's multiple emotions associated with stress, so not necessarily all of them, but one of those uh, very heightened emotions is going to be present. So so I think I can also make peace with what you've described that, that we might say in the outgrade danger zone, there could be very high levels of dopamine. There could be very high levels of adrenaline. There could be very low levels of GABA. There could be very high levels of glutamate um, that could actually be damaging uh, as far as that glutamate. There could be very high levels of acetylcholine that are going on. Um, that one I'm not so sure about. But you've just said not necessarily all of them are happening all at once. But in this spot on the change grid, if there is a high level of, uh, of one of these, this is the region we would be likely to find it in, or one of the regions we'd be very likely to find it in. Right. So it depends on what's, again, because like if a neurotransmitter is just connected to a receptor, and then in another area you have a neurotransmitter connected to a receptor and hormone, something is going to be more yeah. impactful than the other. Right. But I guess I got to oh. throw, I got to throw this in there. It's like, yeah, the, the neuron is connected to whatever dendrites or, you know, name all the physiology you want in the world of, of nerves. Uh, all that is also happening and it's traveling and it's either being transmitted or it's not blah, blah, blah. All that is true. But at the same time, a thought is occurring. Right. So, or some sort of sensory awareness um, is happening. Right. And, because it's not like, you know, unless, you know, if we're talking about an otherwise healthy person, these neurotransmitters and hormones aren't just having their own little party. No. They're, they're being driven by some other system, internal or external to that individual, right? Right. But remember, only the strongest synaptic connection wins. So in other words, everything mm -hmm. about the whole entire nervous system is all about efficiency. So only the strongest connection wins. This is what explains, like, if, we, if we're doing change grip maneuvers, as I said on the call Tuesday, you disrupted someone's app. So you disrupted their association, their pattern, their programming, and their processes that they're used to operating in. So for them to move, and as Tom was talking about, just the right amount mm -hmm. to get them to move, you're now creating new structures. But guess what? those behaviors probably aren't going to be long lived because they have stronger synaptic connections in the old behaviors. All right. So until the new behavior is um, locked in enough, the pattern has repeated itself often enough that a new app is established or the app is modified, people are going to re revert back to whatever the other way of doing things. Right. It'd be a doing. lot easier for them to do that. Okay. That, that is one of the bases of somatic coaching, one of the yeah. concepts behind that, because it's basically saying you need to establish a whole new set of neuro pathways right. um, and, and reinforce them and reinforce them and reinforce them over and over again before you're actually going to shift your pattern and, you know, and, and make any change at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm and I'm wondering, you know, do those does, do those interventions then shift the soup, your neurotransmitter soup. Sooner or later, I, the, the recipe yeah. Yeah. has to be being, uh, being yes. impacted. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Because think about it, when you're doing something new for the first time, and this is what I experiment on myself through what I call personal science. I'm literally diving into micro experiments because I first want to see how it feels, literally. Like, how, how is this registering in my body? Because, again, I said from a, a neuroscience perspective, the neurons are communicating. They're looking for duration, path, and outcome. We call that depot. So if the duration, the path, and outcome are too long, then, you know, you're going to have a shorter uh, somatic feel about this. So you want things to be close. You want it to be up and personal. You want feedback loops. That's why using dopamine to create small wins because dopamine is want more dopamine. So you want to create some small wins sooner than later. You want to understand how you feel about this process. What's, what's your commitment to it? Do you see the duration? Do you see a path? Do you see many paths? 
So I experiment with this all the time on myself personally, but this is what we're actually helping people to do through these maneuvers. Mm -hmm. And so we need the repetition because remember in terms of neuroplasticity, the soup, if you will, you need alertness, you need focus and you need intensity. That literally marks the neuron for change in deep relaxation. Say that again. You need alertness, the focus and intensity, and it marks the neuron for change in deep relaxation. Tell us the difference between alertness and focus. So alertness is just knowing that X is happening and right. focus so, so is learning. selecting. Okay. Right. Right. That's what the deliberate and neuroscience, they call it deliberate practice or deliberate ap application. Mm -hmm. So you're literally applying yourself in a certain way for that feedback. And this is where acetylcholine creates that spark for you so that you're yeah. learning in, while you're in action. I always talk about the difference between motion and action itself. A lot of people are moving and they say, yeah, I'm productive, I'm productive, or I'm busy, I'm busy. But I mean, that doesn't mean you're productive. Right, yeah. Movement does not equal achievement. That's exactly. right. That's exactly. right. So, uh, so Brian, what was the third one? Aware. Oh, first, I'm, I'm aware. Then I'm focused. Then I learn. The intensity. So you're not the just intensity. doing it just to, like, you know, a lot of people have to-do lists, right? And so they're just doing things and checking it off the list because then there's this sense of accomplishment that I've done something. But that's uniquely different when you're doing something and there's, an, there's this sense of uh, emotion that's connected to it. Because if you think mm -hmm. about it, the things that are significant emotional events as they're called, those are better remembered. So if I said 9-11, all of you can probably detail with great vivid details, in fact, where you were, who you were with, Yep. As opposed yep. to something neutral, like what color was the car you parked next to when you drove up at the grocers? Yeah. So yeah. The, that emotion plays a role in helping us to remember. And so, you know, I just put up the engagement ring layer of the change grid. So you talked about awareness and the awareness needs to um, lead to some sort of focus. So I think that's what intention is really all about. Exactly. Something and saying, I'm going to do that. And then you actually have to make it happen. You start to be right. engaged. So what you've just described is the outgrid dynamic as far as growth and uh, learning progress, et cetera. Um, and I, I think it's interesting that you, you kind of said before that there's a reward waiting for you. When you complete this process, you get the reward of a little bit of dopamine. Yeah. Yeah. So there is that reward that's going on there. And depending on what this growth uh, or learning was all about, there could be also some adrenaline, some sort of a feeling of actually conquering something. So it's dopamine up a notch uh, exactly. because you took on a tough kind of a role. Yeah. Tom and I were just talking about that on our call um, in osteopathic medicine. There's a principle called structure function integration. And I took that principle and said, well, the same thing happens in life. Structure is for development and growth is for the function. Mm -hmm. So you, how you structure activities matter because you want to develop through that activity. Then you're really immersed in it. So like when I'm doing things, I really give myself time because I like to immerse in it. I like to see how I'm interacting with it. I like to understand everything about it so it's very easy for me to say no to certain things if i can't immerse myself in it um because i'm looking for that feedback loop and since i'm obsessed with data i could you know journal everything because it's giving me real-time feedback so i journal how i'm feeling i journal what were my thought processes even after like these calls i have a moment of reflection and write something in my journal that i learned from the calls from others comments so it's all these kinds of things that really help because when we talk about these structures, this is the essence of gene expression. So it's like the DNA in your genes isn't, doesn't, is, isn't deterministic in that it's about how it's expressed. And that's a matter, that's a product of environment, that's a product of behavior, it's a product of lifestyle, all the above. Interesting. Really, this I'm loving this. Yeah. Um, now, I do, I want to just bring one uh, 
um, element of your training back to the front for a second. And uh, it has to do with uh, what I want to add to what we know is this idea about dopamine. So you guys were talking about how as people make progress towards a particular thing, they want to get pulled back to the old app. So if we can talk about all this whole app thing, playing itself one more time, I want to remind you of an exercise that I shared with all of you that I used to do with audiences uh, just to talk about making personal changes. And I was trying to illustrate the difference between changes that were driven by external factors and changes that were driven by internal factors. And I was trying to, to say that's why definitive change only occurs two places on the change grid. Those are outgrid changes driven by internal factors and upgrid changes driven by external factors. And so this is the way that that little exercise would work. And again, for all of you, this should just be a review. But I said I would take uh, three people out of the audience have them come up on stage. The person would be, there'd be one on the right, one on the left, one in the middle. The one who was in the middle was the one who was uh, representing the individual who was trying to make some sort of a change. The person on the one side of it, we'll say for the sake of matching to the diagram, on the far left side represented the current situation, the current way of doing things, and that individual held all of the benefits, all the reasons why the current way of doing things was the way it should always be, should never change at all. So they were, they were stuck in that current situation. The other person on the far right, as we look at, the, uh, at this diagram on the screen, would represent the desired situation. And the desired situation uh, is, has its own set of benefits, but benefits that are being promised or benefits that are, are being put out there is what's waiting for you. Now that we've been talking about dopamine, I hear that both of those situations are offering a certain reward. The one on the left, the current situation is saying like, this is the reward that you've already been receiving and you can continue to receive it as long as you just stay here. And then the other one is saying, yeah, but this is the, the dopamine, this is the reward that you're going to get if you do whatever it is you've said you wanted to do. All right, so you got the, these, these three people. Now, here was what the exercise was. I took two giant rubber bands. And one rubber band I put, uh, uh, the inside of the rubber band was the current way of doing things, the person on the far left, and the individual who was in the middle. And those rubber band wasn't tight, but it was straight enough that you could see it on stage, giant rubber bands. Um, and then I said, the other rubber band is going to be between the individual who is standing in the middle and the desired outcome on the far right side of things. So if the person is in the middle, there's kind of an equilibrium, but there is no satisfaction. There's no dopamine in the middle. This is making things so clear now um, because you're in the middle and that's where dopamine is at its lowest. Mind you, serotonin is at its strongest. And so if you can find a way to, to have peace with your current uh, uh, situation, all could be good, but it's this pull, this desire to wanna change. Well, if you think about this, at the beginning, when this whole change dynamic would actually start, and this is what I'd say to the person, you who, who you think you're in the middle right now, you're really not in the middle. You're at your current situation. So I want you to walk all the way back to where that person on the far left is standing. Now, as they moved in that direction, what happened to the tension that was building up in the rubber band between that individual and the desired situation that they imagined? It's increasing and it's getting really, really strong. In fact, at a certain point, it becomes difficult for this individual in the middle to actually get back to the old way of doing things. The, the pull, the draw of the new way is simply too strong. And so, and meanwhile, what's the pull? What's the tension in the rubber band between you and the, and the, the current way of doing things? That rubber band has gotten limp. So there's not a whole lot holding you there. And so you go like, no, nope, I'm going to go to my desired outcome. And then you turn and I said, okay, now walk towards your desired way of doing things and, and walk and walk and walk. And then I'd have the person on the right say, come on, here's the reward. Here's what you're going to get. This is all it's going to be. And we would use simple things like weight loss as a, as a good example of, of all this. And as you get closer and closer and closer to your desired outcome, the pull on the old way of doing things becomes much stronger and the pull of the, your movement towards the desired uh, way of doing things becomes less. 
And so what ends up happening is that you end up in the middle unless something very specific happens. Does anyone remember what that very specific thing is that has to happen if you're ever going to get fully to your desired outcome? Want to remember? You have to cut the rubber band between you and the old way of doing things. You have to sever that tie. You have to abandon that app to put it into, into Brian's way of doing things. Otherwise, you're going to end up in the middle. Now, in the, in the middle, uh, we, we talk about in the accountable self that some changes you want to make in your life offer incremental benefits, and other changes you want to make in life are all or nothing propositions. Well, when it comes to weight loss, to let's say you wanted to lose 20 pounds, that's on the far right side, um, but you end up in the middle, you only lost 10. Well, at least you had an incremental benefit. But what if your goal was to get that book published? Um, and you're only halfway, you got the outline, you got the whatever, <laughs> but you're in the middle. That's, you know, that's, uh, that's, burning. <laughs> that's more of an all or nothing kind of a proposition. Not to say there is any benefit, but you guys get the idea about what I'm describing there? Yeah. That's good. Yeah, yeah that's great. That's great. <laughs> now, that is what's happening when we're talking about uh, things that are internally driven you making a choice to do something and why I'm, if, you, if I sound excited right now it's because this is the first time I've realized that the same dynamic holds true the same rubber bands if we're going vertically as well mm -hmm. think about yeah. that now it's different it's something external that's driving it so I'm still you know usually I'm going to be more down grid unless there's you know something is pulling me up grid I have no reason to go up there um, but as that pull of dealing with this upgrade issue is getting stronger and stronger the, uh, the, the 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 pull back to this old way of doing things or this downgrade opportunity is also still there it's kind of like don't even do that you could just avoid it altogether uh, you know why delay until tomorrow what can be postponed indefinitely you know, so we talk about procrastination and, and all that sort of a thing. So I think the same dynamic is holding true when we look about externally driven things. And I can see now that the dopamine is still um, being validated in that. There is a great reward in just staying in the downgrade danger zone. It's comfortable. Yeah. There's also great reward in successfully managing the upgrade danger zone because you're still alive. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> so this is That's really good. very, very interesting. And so I'm going to throw this out. I know we're a few minutes over, but for Tuesday, if you guys will remind me, I'll try to, to remember, but we look at dopamine and we look at serotonin. And we see that their relationship is, uh, is inverse, is tied to one another, where one is weak, the other is strong, et cetera. So they're not really, um, yeah. So does that mean that serotonin is the enemy of change? Hmm. So, yeah, don't really know. Is dopamine what's driving us one way or another? To, uh, to, to be in a particular state, even though that state uh, may be dramatic in uh, you know, any way, shape, or form you want to describe it, but there's some reward that I'm getting. So, but if I'm in the middle of the change grid, there's no change happening. Really, there's readiness to change, there's openness, but there's nothing really saying X needs to be happening right now. So, yeah, so that's what I'd like to explore. Is serotonin its own reward? Uh, but what happens? And I'll, I'll just share one, la one last thing, and that is that I told all of you that, uh, and I, I, I'd say this to the whole world, I've always been dealing with depression my, my entire life, and you know, anxiety, but more depression than anxiety. If it wasn't for SSRIs, I really don't know that I would be... Uh, uh, you know, I told you it's a life changer for me. So, uh, I, you know, gay SSRIs. But some of the SSRIs that I've tried before we found the right one left me feeling absolutely flat. So I wasn't depressed anymore. I wasn't anxious anymore. The truth is I wasn't anymore. Mm 
And so there was this kind of robbing. It's like, if you want to have a little bit of an up in life, you got to be willing to have a little bit of a down in life. When things become too flat, too, um, I guess, mid-grid, it's only satisfying for a very short period of time because that's not where life is lived. That's where life is observed. Uh, but, you know, it's almost like it's too much detachment. So, yeah. So that's, that's interesting. I think the serotonin will have more of a, um, I like to use the word centering effect on dopamine. Yeah. Okay. So I don't think it'll necessarily be the enemy as it will be, it'll act kind of like a GABA would do. It'll be the breaks. So serotonin will kind of pull you in so that as you're seeking these rewards, you become more inward facing in terms of honoring what really matters about what it is you're seeking. So to validate your why, and that will change your whole experience and you going about what you're doing. Right. And I'm glad you said that because to me, what you've just described is what I was saying about you have to change the app. Right. Because, because otherwise, if the app stays the way that it always is, you're going to stay in one of these spots. Right. Because that like, app, I've always been an achiever, but I can guarantee you now that I'm in my 50s, the reason I achieve uh, and why I'm achieving is uniquely different than when I was uh, in my 20s or 30s. Because mm -hmm. back then as an athlete, I didn't want to just win. I wanted to kick your butt. <laughs> but that wouldn't be the case right now. You know, I'm more, uh, you know, the, the caring detachment kind of thing really matters to me at this point that I'm considering my legacy and what I want to do should I live another 50 years. So that's well, more important to me. And, you know, um, as you say that, one of the things that is happening is that's an identity shift in you. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And that whole, that whole notion of um, unless we shift the identity that we have relative to what's going on, the, it won't be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. something, something has to shift in the mindset. Otherwise, it's, it's, you, know, you, can, you can shift a bit here, but the rubber band will pull you back because there isn't a change in that identity to support the new way of being. Yep. Yep. If yep. I can add to that, what T said about cutting the rubber band, that's what that identity shift is, right? Uh, uh, uh. Yep, saying that's, and then by the way, once the pull of the old way of doing things is no longer present, how quickly do you move to the new way of doing things? Yeah. You yeah. know, because you don't have this, this it ta change takes energy. And if I can say I relinquish my my attachment to my old way of doing things once and for all, who was the the was it Cortez that burned the ships and said yeah. you're here? <laughs> so there there is no return into the old way of doing things. You're here. It's kind of like in, in a certain way that was very liberating. This is good. I, so I have a question, if I may ask it, and we may talk about it on the next call, but I'll ask it. I've heard. Um, you know, based on what Ellen was talking about, I heard that it isn't that identity follows behavior. Um, is, is yeah, that behavior comes first, then identity. So identity follows behavior. But I think in popular psychology, it's always um, put forth the, the opposite. Well, but, I don't think that there. I don't think that there, Brian. Um, that it's an either or. I can tell you just a brief story. I had uh, a senior leader uh, at a government agency who was doing all kinds of things for people and she was very busy uh, and, and felt that her own people weren't accountable, but she was, and, and then she just casually used the word, you know, some days it's like babysitting. And I said, oh, stop for a moment. Tell me what it's like to be a babysitter. And what babysitting is like, and and so she would describe that, and we even got into um, her her boss, who she also had to babysit, and was like a a parent who wasn't doing the right thing. And I said, so so if you weren't the babysitter, who would you be? Uh -huh. And she said, well, I would be the deputy chief, which is my job. And I said, so if you were the deputy chief, what would you be doing that's different than the babysitter? Mm. And so she started to talk about immediately holding people accountable, uh, giving them support, but not, you know, and so then she comes back the next week uh, and we're talking and she said, boy, 
uh, I could feel it every time I was doing something that started to feel like babysitting. I thought I'm not the babysitter. Mm -hmm. And so then she started, you know, talking in another way about these things and the results she was getting, which was people were willing to assume the responsibility she was putting on her them mm -hmm. rather than them fighting back. In fact, they were engaged. So she got the kind of the dopamine reward. But in that case, I would argue that her behavior hadn't changed first. The identity changed. Well, uh, and so what if we said and, that? And the old identity. Now, if she were starting to do that, if she were behaving differently, and she got the instruction that she couldn't do this anymore, it might be that ultimately the behavior would then get her thinking, oh, I'm operating like the deputy chief. But I would, you know, and then maybe there would be that shift. Um, but, uh, okay. Diane would say that behavior never changes until thought changes. And that's what uh, this would say, that I, if we okay. shift the identity, then the behavior can change because otherwise it's too easy to go back to being, yeah. there's, there was too much prior, prior reinforcement because people loved it when they did her work, when she did their work. Absolutely. Edie, you've got your hand up. What do you want to chime in? That's good. That's good. There? Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's really important just to go like, you know, everything begins in the mind. Yeah. And so to me, uh, if we look about the, the, the how these steps, I, mean, I change my thoughts, my thoughts change my chemistry, my chemistry changes behavior. Is that how things tend to work? Don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well. If that's the case, then you then talk therapy could work. Well, and that's, and Diane would say that to you, that it does work, but people want to know, uh, her, her puzzle when she was working on her PhD was, why does it take so long? Okay. And, and so why it's about is, a threshold. It's about a threshold. Yeah, and her whole idea was about the content of the talk therapy, that a lot okay. of the talk therapy was end up people creating their own story yes. in order to try to explain why they were feeling. So there was, it's like they were having feelings without content. Yes, yes. So they had to create the content. And she goes, if we get your chemistry right, that content <laughs> will go away because it's being invented. Yes. So, and yeah. what, and then we'll see what's left <laughs> and that's and, what we really need to talk about and that, can you and hear that me? maybe and maybe yeah, Andy, we can, yeah we can hear you that's biofeedback so we can have a whole thing about biofeedback relative to that too exactly right yeah Edie, go right ahead yeah i'm going crazy here you know what <laughs> really 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 all of you are right it is a two-way street do not look at it as either or as a psychotherapist i've worked with mind body but as uh, somebody that studied with J.L. Moreno, the father of psychodrama, oh, yeah. actions, you know, act the way you want to be and you'll change the way, you know, you think too. Yep. And, and so it goes both ways. There's a, a professor that I'm kind of associated with in Scotland that wrote a book on action and action IQ. And, and so it, it, it goes both ways. It really, that's why we have. But I, I would argue, I've been to the Moreno Institute too. And when you do that, you assume a different identity to act out in the, in the, when you do your psychodrama. Yeah, you do. But, but there are, that's why we have such a plethora of therapies. It goes both ways. We have a lot of movement therapies and felt sure. and Christ. So, so it honestly goes both ways. And, and yes. I'm yeah. just, I kind of use them all. It Love depends. It. Because it. if the only tool you have is a hammer, you treat everybody as if it's a nail. Exactly. exactly. And, right. and exactly. so I think we have to know there's both and you decide which works for who. That's yes. Yes. Which, yes. which is going to be which is going to resonate with the client. It's not like there is a, a way right. right, because right now you you have to intuit where that client is and with what's being presented to you. And is it going to take movement? And, and, and actually when we do narrative ther when we do narrative coaching, we do a lot with psychodrama. So right. we, do, we do several chairs. Um, we will have people pick up an object and do something to bring it along. So that's very much, there's a, a real somatic component to narrative coaching. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's well, obviously, we have a lot of stuff we could be talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've gone well over our time for today, but I certainly appreciate you guys being fun. involved in the dialogue. So uh, thanks all so much for joining me. We'll chat again on uh, Tuesday. So bye for now, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.